hello everybody and welcome again to another OpenShift Commons briefing. This time we have Univa um, and their CTO, Fritz Burstel, and one of their engineers, Stefan Haas. And we're going to be talking about virtual multi-tenancy and running non-container workloads on OpenShift. Um, I know this works in generic Kubernetes as well, but um, we're really pleased to have this approach being explained to us. And um, we're going to learn all about how their offering NavOps helps us to make this a reality. So without further ado, I'm going to let Fritz and start us off and um, get us introduced to what Unit has been doing and let you take it away. Oh, thank you, Diane. I uh, hope you can hear me and uh, thanks for having us. So jumping right into uh, the first slide here. Um, just by way of introduction, very briefly, who we are. Um, so I'm uh, Fritz Furstel, I'm the CTO at Univa. Uh, I've been around the block for quite some time, uh, pretty much always focused on uh, workload and resource management in distributed environments. And uh, more recently, I have been uh, uh, focusing my attention onto uh, container orchestration, so uh, mainly Kubernetes actually, but also a little bit on Swarm, Mesos and so on. And Stefan uh, has been an engineer with us uh, with a, a pretty long tenure as well. Uh, he has been working for some time in our uh, core technology, which I will briefly introduce uh, a little bit later, and uh, now has been uh, switching over uh, to working on our container-facing product that is uh, called NavOps. And uh, he has been instrumental in integrating NavOps with uh, OpenShift and also uh, uh, doing this uh, mixed workload support that we will be uh, seeing in the demo a little bit later uh, today. Uh, also, very uh, briefly, by way of introduction, who Univa is. Um, so we uh, really are focused around uh, allowing customers uh, using large shared infrastructure for any type of workload, be that containerized or not containerized. We have uh, offices based in uh, Chicago, uh, in Canada, and in Germany. Uh, and uh, we're really focused around uh, enterprise customers. Uh, Fortune 500 uh, companies are really mainly our customer base, of which I have a bunch of logos here on the next slide. We're, uh, oops, one slide too much. Um, we are uh, uh, really addressing a wide uh, breadth of markets. And in those markets, we usually have uh, uh, the biggest companies, biggest clusters in that market that are being driven by our uh, core technology. That is not a recent technology. It actually have been, has been around for more than 15 years called uh, Grid Engine. If people of, of uh, here uh, remember Sun Grid Engine, then that's where it came from. Um, and uh, uh, that technology uh, drives some of the biggest clusters. So some of them, for instance, here have uh, many hundred thousand uh, cores and uh, run very business critical uh, types of applications for these types of companies. And again, it's, it goes really across uh, different markets, very diverse applications. And uh, for the mixed workload support, that is also one of the uh, pieces that we're going to use because all of these applications, uh, all of these workflows are already integrated with our core technology. And uh, uh, that uh, makes it much easier for customers uh, to utilize uh, the solution then. But late, more on that a little bit later. So let me first uh, jump into what we're doing in container land, um, specifically in Kubernetes land. Uh, we have been... Uh, uh, always get uh, two slides advanced, sorry for that. Um, uh, we have been created, creating a, uh, a product suite, which we call uh, NavOps and the NavOps command. One of the products in that suite is our uh, uh, corner product in, in that space. And it really, again, as we uh, usually do, focuses on uh, workload and resource management. In particular, it provides a virtual multi-tenancy. By that, we mean uh, teams, projects, whatever organizational breakdown of your uh, workloads you have uh, can share a single or just few uh, clusters and uh, you know make a, a combined use of it and, and drive up utilization of that infrastructure uh, and get 
better return on investment. Um, uh, then we also, to drive that further, uh, provide the ability uh, to run mixed workloads. By that, we mean containerized and non-containerized workloads on exactly that same uh, infrastructure, again, to drive up utilization and make it easier to integrate into existing environments or to migrate from existing environment into uh, container-facing uh, architectures. And we also uh, manage scarcity with it. By that, again, we mean uh, if you have uh, different applications, different workflows, different projects, teams that compete for resources uh, and there is not enough to do all of them at the same time, then we handle a prioritization uh, service level agreements uh, automatically in order to, to get the most important work done uh, at the right time and, and uh, get, give it access to the right resources. Um, so, of course, you don't do that uh, just out of fun. You do it for a reason, and that reason is uh, a better return on investment on your infrastructure. Um, we have been talking to customers who are in the process of adopting uh, Kubernetes uh, big time or OpenShift. Uh, in most cases, actually, when you talk to uh, uh, commercial customers, uh, and some of those customers, uh, for instance, were planning to uh, create many, many dozen of uh, 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 OpenShift clusters um, for the different projects for the different stages of the product uh, project, so dev, uh, test, uh, um, uh, production stage, and so on. And uh, you know, if you have many dozens of of those clusters, then of course that drives inefficiency. For one thing, to maintain all those different clusters, uh, uh, to make sure you know they're running properly, to upgrade them, etc. And then uh, at the same time, uh, none of these clusters ever will be utilized uh, uh, to a good extent. I mean, you will always have idle resources in those clusters. And the consequence is that the overall environment will probably have a pretty poor utilization. And what we, uh, the, the type of functionality that we provide allows to consolidate those clusters and drive up utilization. Actually, the, the larger 50% uh, utilization that I have here on the slide is very, very conservative in uh, the environments that I was talking about uh, before where our uh, core technology is being used. Uh, I mean, where I said, you know, hundreds of thousands of cores, uh, we actually see regularly utilization rates of 80% and in some cases uh, way above 90%. And that's uh, necessary. I mean, if you have environments that big, uh, they may cost $100 million uh, total cost of ownership. Uh, so a few percent of uh, uh, utilization make a big difference there. Um, some of the unique capabilities that our solution provides. Uh, so first of all, uh, something that isn't really currently in, in any product as far as I can see in the uh, Kubernetes space is that we prioritize workloads and uh, that's uh, pretty much automatic. So by way of uh, uh, getting the workload properly submitted uh, to your system, uh, and advertising certain things to our uh, uh, scheduler, uh, we prioritize that automatically and dynamically. We have a sophisticated policy system, as we shall see in uh, a slide that uh, follows uh, uh, shortly. And we provide mixed workload support, so for containerized and non-containerized workloads. And then we have a whole set of uh, uh, functionality that makes it easier to use the system. So for instance, a web UI uh, to drive the policy configuration and of course the CLI and the REST API as well. Um, our uh, workloads are affiliation or our workload decision-making is affiliation based. So uh, if, as I mentioned before, when you submit your workload properly, uh, then uh, we will know where it comes from. For instance, who is the owner, who is the project, uh, is there a certain workload template that you want to use, and that will be used in the automatic uh, policy decision making. We do support any uh, Kubernetes distribution. Our solution is totally pluggable. I'll talk about that also in a minute. And uh, you can actually uh, reconfigure the policy system on the fly. There is no need to stop any components and restart them if you have made a change. It's uh, just really uh, changing some uh, uh, of the policy configuration in the web UI, for instance. And immediately, uh, the changes will take effect. Uh, so very, very simply stating uh, what NavOps command is, it is a kind of replacement for the uh, Kubernetes scheduler. 
Uh, that's not 100% correct, really. What happens is that we uh, do install NetApps command side by side with the uh, Kubernetes scheduler. You can use the uh, stock scheduler, uh, and you can use in parallel the Kubernetes scheduler. So for uh, sorry, the command scheduler, NetApps command scheduler for different types of workloads. Um, but you could also, if you wanted to, completely replace the Kubernetes scheduler with NetApps command. That is a, a configuration option. In most cases, we probably would recommend uh, to run them side by side. Um, a few more words about the solution as such from a technical point of view. So first of all, NetApps command is uh, itself uh, a, a service. It's a multi-container application. It ships basically as a pod that you can uh, just uh, uh, start, or actually two pods that you can just start uh, by uh, curling a YAML file and uh, getting it created in the uh, Kubernetes cluster. Um, it has a couple of components. I have an architecture slide on that uh, later on. And itself, it interacts uh, basically completely with the Kube API server. Uh, so uh, there isn't really anything uh, that it does that you know doesn't fit a regular Kubernetes system. Hence, it is pluggable. And uh, as an end user, you continue to interact with uh, the Kube API server. So you submit your job with Kube control, you make your changes with Kube control. The only thing that you do specifically, if you want to make policy <clears throat> changes to NetOps command, then what you would do is you would use our web UI, CLI, or REST API uh, to do so. Inside of uh, NetOps command, it uses the policy engine that we have been developing uh, for um, many, many years in uh, you know, our core uh, business that I was mentioning before with you know, high, high scalability, rich policies, and so on. So here is a uh, uh, architecture diagram uh, of how it works. As you can see on the left side, there is the Kube API, and then uh, the end user directly interacts with it. And uh, NetApps command itself, uh, again, also interacts with the uh, Kube API. It basically uh, registers events, uh, gets uh, you know any changes that happens to objects in the Kube API, and uh, integrates that with uh, its policy system. And if there is uh, a scheduling decision to be made, then it, it makes it in the same way as uh, the stock scheduler uh, does it. As an admin, you would be interacting with the NetApps command uh, system through its web UI, CLI, and REST API. The CLI is modeled uh, pretty much uh, uh, after kube control, so there's there's quite a fam familiarity there. And then, of course, uh, the web UI is, it does its own thing. And we will see the web UI in action later when uh, Stefan runs the demo. Uh, a little bit of an overview of the policy system. We will see it also later in, in the web UI, but let me first start at the upper right. Uh, the workload affiliation is a core part. I've mentioned uh, it before. So we have extended uh, some of the labeling and uh, annotation uh, uh, properties of uh, a uh, Kubernetes manifest, pod manifest, uh, so you can express these things. You can express who is the owner of a workload, uh, which project uh, does it belong to, and uh, which application profile, which is kind of a, a, a workflow, a workload template, uh, does it belong to. And once you have done that, you've, you've given our uh, NetApps command scheduler information that it can use then uh, in the context of all these uh, other policies that you see on the screen. We also do have the the default policies that uh, um, the stock scheduler Kubernetes stock scheduler has, meaning uh, pack and spread um, when it comes to node selection. But we do have additional uh, policies. For instance, the maximize utilization, which allows you uh, to not only uh, just uh, you know distribute workloads, but to actually look at what's the current uh, utilization of resources on a node what's the type of uh, requirement that a workload has, and uh, then it looks for the best fit uh, of that workload, so to really uh, uh, create balanced uh, uh, workload placement and uh, good performance of those workloads. But that's just the node selection. We have, of course, uh, additional policies, and uh, those policies on the one hand are about uh, workload priority, 
and there is a bunch of uh, sub policies there. For instance, the proportional shares policy, which allows you to subdivide uh, your your cluster into those multi-tenant partitions. Uh, there is an interleaving policy, which allows you to maintain certain ratios of replicas uh, following uh, policy guidance. There is ranking, which simply allows you to you know rank uh, applications uh, by application profile or by resource. And then there is uh, workload isolation quotas. Uh, so for instance, runtime quotas and access restrictions. We will see uh, some of these in action in the demo later. So but that just by way of, of overview. Uh, here is just a, a screenshot of one of them. That's the uh, proportional sharing, and uh, that is a screenshot of the web UI, and uh, it shows uh, uh, how you can more or less graphically subdivide your environment into uh, you know different uh, uh, partitions and uh, do that even in a hierarchical fa uh, fa uh, fashion. So you can uh, subdivide a partition again and again, uh, depending on how you want it uh, to be done. Um, maybe one word before we uh, dive more into the demo use case itself on uh, is this all uh, really necessary, all these policies and so on. And, and our uh, point is, yes, it is, absolutely. Uh, we do live in a world where uh, resources are finite. I mean, sometimes cloud uh, give you the illusion they are infinite. You could always add another resource and another resource, but the fact of the matter is, uh, if nothing else is limited, then at least budgets. And if you're using on-prem resources, then uh, there are limitations anyhow. We see it ourselves in our own development. Uh, I mean, some of the uh, grassroots things that we have done first with clouds have started uh, relatively nimble. But uh, once you let that go for a couple of months and you look at the bill that you're getting from cloud providers, you go, what? Are we really paying that much? And uh, you immediately have to think about uh, uh, you know, utilizing your resources better because otherwise the spending gets out of hand. Um, so uh, if you recognize that uh, there is a restriction of resources, which basically at the end of the day you know, comes down, you have just a certain amount of servers, then uh, uh, sharing resources is actually a key thing. And uh, uh, then you need to automate uh, that type of sharing because otherwise you're, you're constantly in the business of uh, uh, re, uh, uh, yeah, reconfiguring your environment. So that's why we have been uh, uh, creating uh, policies that can automatically maintain SLAs, resource partitions, and uh, similar things like that. And our solution really is combining resources into larger clusters and uh, get that sharing to work uh, so you can actually achieve more with, with less uh, uh, spending. Uh, and that prioritization uh, that you have there in, in as, at the heart of those policies is really very, very important. Um, you always have dynamic changes. I mean, you, you could have something that is uh, uh, crucially important now, uh, could be uh, less important uh, when some other workload comes up, you know, that has a, a higher priority at, at that moment. Uh, so you always have to stay on top of those things, and there's really no way to do that uh, other than automating uh, information. Also, uh, you want to give as much information as you can to a scheduler. You don't want to withhold things. So, for instance, Kubernetes provides this uh, notion of uh, submission quotas or, or access quotas. Uh, these are good. These are sometimes useful, but uh, they basically hide information from the scheduler that additional work really would want to run. Uh, and you know, our uh, belief is that you really have to give the schedule as much information as possible. That's why, for instance, we have runtime uh, quotas, so you don't have to hide something. The scheduler will make sure it doesn't run if it's not supposed to run. Um, also, if you give the scheduler all of this information and you uh, look at the scheduler, what the decision-making process is, that then you can analyze why certain decisions were made and why maybe you were running against the wall. So for instance, if a certain uh, type of service uh, cannot get enough replica uh, running, then uh, looking at why the scheduler had to make those decisions uh, may reveal that you're lacking some critical resources. Uh, maybe you need to buy additional resources or allocate them uh, through a cloud. So really you can do some capacity planning if you have a, uh, a sophisticated scheduler and you can inspect uh, what type of decisions it is making.
Uh, now coming to the demo use case uh, and uh, mixed workload. Uh, so um, first of all, the environment that we will be looking at is uh, an OpenShift uh, uh, cluster and we have command uh, installed on top of it that manages some containerized services and containerized applications. Um, and you know that gives you all that nice uh, policy control that I was talking about. But what if you uh, want to run uh, non-containerized applications? You could, of course, run them uh, at the side of this environment and maybe split your cluster and, and have some part running containerized services and another part running non-containerized work. But the problem is, of course, first of all, again, you would be creating silos and inefficiencies. And then also, if those non-containerized workloads need to interact with the containerized workloads, then you will benefit from uh, sharing the same networking setup, same storage solutions, et cetera. So uh, what we have uh, uh, created is uh, a version of our Univa Grid Engine uh, technology that, as I mentioned, is integrated with many, many thousands of applications, hundreds of workflows, um, and uh, uh, it, it actually can also handle containerized workloads, but, but really more like batch workloads in that context, not services. Um, but the idea is you, you run Univa Grid Engine, in this case, uh, itself as a containerized uh, uh, service. It, it runs um, a basically a workload processing service, uh, but the work it runs doesn't have to be containerized itself. And uh, you know that immediately gives you access um, uh, to an integrated approach in, in that context. So the demo use case that we will be looking at is uh, uh, we have basically two teams uh, that we are uh, kind of emulating. One is the development team, CICD, and the other one is the operations team uh, that runs uh, that has a, a batch team that runs batch workloads and the services team that runs service workloads. Uh, then in terms of the workloads that are being run, there will be a number of uh, development uh, jobs and tasks uh, for dev and test purposes. And then there will be services tasks also uh, and batch applications. Those batch applications will be non-containerized. And the uh, uh, demo environment is going to be hosted on AWS. And as I've mentioned before, it runs uh, uh, using OpenShift and then command is deployed as a scheduler into it. Uh, with that, I uh, hand over to uh, Stefan. And uh, uh, let me just stop sharing. And I hope Stefan, Stefan can move over. Make sure you unmute yourself. So can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Perfect. So, thank you, Fritz, and uh, welcome to the demo of the mixed workload support of Nabox command on top of um, this Red Hat OpenShift system. Um, as we heard, Nabox command provides virtual multi-tenancy on top of Red Hat OpenShift. Um, it allows to share one cluster among multiple teams, applications, or even services. It even allows to run containerized and non-containerized workload in the same environment by running our Univa Grid Engine as a workload processing service for these non-containerized applications on top of OpenShift. Um, this is what I'm going to demonstrate you right now. So let's dive directly into, directly into what NetApps command mixed workload support allows you to have running simultaneously. Um, and here uh, you can see the containerized application and services that are running on the cluster currently. So we have some production um, servers that are uh, replicated two times. Um, here's the second one. Uh, a backend batch application currently scaled to something like eight um, instances. And we have the Univa Grid Engine Workload Processing Service um, currently scaled to one uh, instance, as also the Univa Grid Engine Master Service, uh, which you can see right here, oops, on the last line. So here on the right side is a few um, of the non-containerized workloads running inside the Univa Grid Engine Service um, that is currently scaled to one part in the OpenShift cluster. 
Um, as Fritz already said, Unibail Grid Engine is a leading workload management solution and is integrated with thousands of applications and hundreds of workloads. In our demo, we are running non-containerized applications and we have currently up to two running uh, non-containerized applications per Unibail Grid Engine part. As you can see here, we have um, this job 75 and 76 running inside the Unibail Grid Engine service. So now let's have a look uh, at how this environment is managed through NetApps command and how we can modify and enforce the virtual multi-tenancy policies through it. Let me just change to the NetApps UI. So what you see here is an organizational breakdown of how the entire cluster resources are to be used. It is reflected in the so-called proportional share policy of NetApps command. The full width of the diagram represents 100% of the cluster resources. Um, at the highest level, we have split it between CI, CD, continuous integration and continuous de uh, development, and ops, which is uh, responsible for the production workloads. Um, for CI, CD, we have dev and test work, uh, which has roughly configured to a third of the overall cluster resource. Um, but for simplicity reasons, we are not running any dev or test work as part of this demo. So let's focus on the OPS side that owns the larger amount um, of the cluster. We have split it down further between batch and services work with the bigger share is going to batch. And the batch resources we have configured mostly to be consumed by work in the backend project while only roughly a quarter is assigned to run non-containerized workloads that get managed by Univer Grid Engine uh, service. We are also running our production uh, service and have configured resources for that. Furthermore we, have, uh, furthermore, we have also made a provision for running administrative tasks, but we are not going to demonstrate that right now here, again, to keep things uh, simple. So the workloads you saw running consume uh, you saw running consume cluster resource organized by the three um, lowest level projects in this diagram. So the grid engine project is using um, resources, the backend project as also the production um, project. Now let's make a change by moving the slider between grid engine and backend uh, and the backend project to give much more resources to universal grid engine, something like. Uh, 80-20. Save that configuration um, and switch back to our workload management system uh, view, sorry. And this may take a while, but for 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 clarity, um, I, I have uh, opened another view um, where I do not show the depending parts as also the completed job. So I, I will not uh, switch back to the uh, to the OpenShift web UI anymore. So due to this change, we will see how backend parts get scaled down and the Univer grid engine execution daemon parts should get should eat up the free resources. Um, as I said, the shift will take a little while and we uh, while we will change back to the NetApps command. So I can show you while that uh, a couple of another um, policies you can change in the in the NetOps uh, UI. Um, you might have noticed that there are only ten pods running at a time owned by the batch team. Um, the UG exec uh, pods and the UG master pod belongs to the grid engine project, and the backend jobs um, belong to the uh, backend project. Both of them are part of the mixed. Um, workload namespace. Um, within for each uh, namespace, you can set up so called um, quotas. And I set a quota, I called it limit batch for this namespace, which limits the grid engine as also the backend project combined to run only 10 pods at a time. When we now get back to our view, we will see that there are running much more um, execution demons um, than backend jobs, which is uh, uh, which is due to the change we did in the in the resource uh, in the, the proportional share. And if you have a look at the UG Queue Master, 
Um, sorry, I got locked out. We will, now we see that all these um, new execution demons are automatically added to the Univer Grid Engine cluster. And all of these um, newly started UG execution demons are, are filled with legacy non-containerized workflows. So let's have a look what else can be configured within NevOps command. So as Fritz already said, um, beside the Kubernetes default pod placement rules, pack and spread, um, we have also um, the, the so-called maximize utilization, which tries to automatically balance the workload placement and mix um, where you can specify entities which should get packed and entities which should get spread in your OpenShift cluster. Um, in NetOps command, you also have the possibility to create predefined profiles, um, the so-called application profiles. In this example, I created a profile for a web server as also one for, for example, a database. Uh, in the database profile, it is configured that pods tied to that, to that profile need to get tis, dispatched to a node which has at least five gig of memory. Uh, another interesting additional feature to Kubernetes is the so-called um, interleaving. Um, for example, if you want to keep a ratio of one database pod, um, let's do it. To, to five web server pods, you can configure it here like that. Five by seven. Web server. This means that for each database pod, you will be able to run five web server pods. So um, this concludes my brief demo of the mixed workload support of NetApps command on top of OpenShift. So again, what you saw was a single OpenShift cluster that ran standard containerized workloads along with Uniper Grid Engine as a workload processing service for non-containerized legacy workload on top of that. Uh, I also demonstrated how NetApps command can be used to segment the resources in one shared OpenShift-based cluster dynamically to provide um, this virtual multi-tenancy. Uh, thank you for watching the demo. Awesome, Stefan. I'm looking to see if there's any questions in from the folks who are participating here and, and watching on. And if you have them, um, raise your hand in the chat and, and we'll turn on your mic so you can ask them. Um, I'll give you a second if there are questions. I, it, it's interesting because for me, I was thinking of Univa as something more of um, on on-premise offering. And so the thing that I got out of this today was that um, that this is this is not, it's, any, uh, it's sort of a great hybrid op application as well. So this has pretty, been pretty interesting to, to see this and to see it do the things, the scheduler that comes with Kubernetes is pretty, um, pretty basic. And um, the things that you guys have done with um, your grid Grid engine over the years has given you a lot of background and experience in, in integrating this and making the you know the actual things that the reality things that we need for ops and to really make an enterprise offering on top of Kubernetes um, with the workload priorities is pretty pretty awesome. So um, I'm pleased that that we've gotten to get this um, integration done. I'm looking again to see if there's any other questions. Is there anything else you'd like to add, Fritz or Stefan? Uh, no, I mean you, you actually uh, summed it up uh, very well, Diane. I mean that's that's exactly uh, you know what we're trying to accomplish. That uh, people who are running this uh, in serious production and you know uh, inadvertently will run into the situation where they have you know lots of different teams, lots of projects, and so on, beating on the same type of resource uh, that they have the ability to manage this properly, yeah. um, and. If there is any follow-on questions uh, that come up later uh, here on this last slide, which hopefully is visible, uh, you can uh, see how to get in touch with us. Perfect. And Stefan, thank you for the for the demo. Um, I, I'm really, especially in the beginning, one of the things that I really like is that you're doing the myth busting about the unlimited capacity of the cloud. 
um, in, especially on premise as well, there's, there's always a limit. Someone always has to buy more resources or upgrade things. So this is quite a quite an interesting um, solution, and I, I think that we're going to uh, on your customer list there. I saw quite a few OpenShift customers too, so I know we're doing a lot of work mutually with you. So this has been quite an eye opener. So thank you again for coming today. And if you have any questions, please reach out to them directly or hit them up on the Slack channel. Um, also, all all of these guys, plus a few more from Univa, will be at the OpenShift Commons gathering in Berlin in just um, under two months um, on March 28th. And if you're interested in coming, reach out to me and I'll see, see if I can get you um, into it. It's co-located with KubeCon, so if you're already going to KubeCon, um, take a look at um, commons.openshift.org and you can find out all the information about the upcoming events as well as um, all the upcoming briefings over the next few weeks and months. So thanks again, Fritz and Stefan, and um, thank you all for joining us. Um, and we hope uh, you found this interesting too, and we'll talk to you again next week. So thanks all. Yep, thanks Dan for, for having us, and uh, thanks for everybody uh, watching.